Open your Bibles to Matthew 24. We're moving along here, and we're looking at this section of Scripture that's really, honestly, heavy as Jesus talks about the end of all things, the end of the age. Really, he's talking about what's coming in the near future for the disciples leading up to 70 AD when the Roman army comes in and destroys Jerusalem and destroys the temple. So it's a very serious and sobering message he's sharing with them, and it has to do with the future that is before us when God wraps everything up down here. We don't know exactly when that's going to be, but we all know at some point things are going to come to an end. As I've said before, I think it's worth saying, even people who would reject God and reject the Bible still kind of have this sense, and you hear them talk about their fear about the end, and that's why there are all these measures to take care of the earth and everything else, like just to try to preserve it as long as possible. There's this understanding, even scientifically, that things are winding down. And Jesus is giving us everything we need to know about that and really helping us have a solid foundation for our feet, an anchor for our soul to know the truth about his sovereignty and his plan and wrapping everything up and the truth about how secure we are in our relationship with him because of Jesus. Now, before we move into the section we're going to go through in Matthew 24 this morning, which is verse 15 down to verse 35, we're going to actually handle a pretty significant chunk of scripture this morning. But before we move through that, which we'll move through rather quickly, but before we do, I want us to wrestle with this question for a minute. Why would God let people, little creatures, defile, desecrate, and even destroy his house. That's what we're going to see in the section we're going to look at this morning. Why would God let people defile, desecrate, and even destroy his house, a place that is understood as his house down here? And in order to help you think about the significance of that and the mystery of that, think about some real-life types of scenarios that we've had. Maybe you've had someone come for a holiday meal, Christmas or Thanksgiving, some big holiday meal. It's a relative of yours, and they've come, and they've decided they want to use that opportunity to preach their political views. And let's say they have the opposite political views that you, than you have. And they come, and they're preaching their ideology, and they're offending you, and they're in your house doing it. If that's ever happened to you, and some of you it probably has happened, you know what that feels like. It's not a peaceful feeling on the inside. You're, you're feeling frustration and hostility toward this person. And you're appalled that they would have the audacity to come do this in your house. Maybe something different. Maybe one of your children has invited a friend over and they start using language or, or watching things with your child that you don't want your child watching. And you're thinking, how dare they do that in my house? It's your turf, right? And you have things the way you want them. And in a way, it is sacred to you. It's holy ground to you. And if you could prevent it or avoid it, you would. You wouldn't let that happen. So the question is, for us to wrestle with, why would God let this happen? Think about that as we move through and talk about all the horrible things that are going to play out down here. In God's temple and in God's world globally. And I think that'll help us connect it to our own hearts and to see, which is what we're always up to around here, to see Christ and the gospel with greater clarity and be even more amazed by it. So that's where we're going. Let's start in verse 15. He's already said there's going to be a lot of bad things happening. Wars, kingdoms colliding, earthquakes, famines, persecution, all that bad stuff he's talked about in the first 14 verses of this chapter. Now, verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, what in the world is that? Nice ring to it, kind of a morbid ring to it. What in the world is that? We'll talk about that. When you see it, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then that those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. 
Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved, for, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So stop there in verse 22. He's mentioned the abomination of desolation, and he says when this happens, he doesn't say fight back, he doesn't say defend, he doesn't say hold your ground, he says run, run for the hills, get out. Because, as he's already taught them in the beginning of this chapter, it's coming down. Jerusalem's coming down. The temple is coming down. So he says, get out while you can. Now, let's talk about this abomination of desolation for a minute. A little history. I find the history fascinating, and it helps to give more depth to this. And it helps us to put ourselves in the sandals of the disciples and what they would have been thinking. So what is the abomination of desolation? Or in some translations, the abomination which causes desolation. Well, you might know an abomination is like we talked about earlier. When someone defiles something sacred, it's abominable, it's offensive, it's extremely offensive. And desolation, of course, has to do with the clearing out so that something is desolate, unlivable. And here's what he's talking about. When the Romans come under Titus and they surround Jerusalem... And they even cut off communications and they cut off supplies so that food can't come in. And there's famine. And some historians say that during this time, this is all going to happen in the near future, one generation from when Jesus gave these teachings to them. And historians say that it was so bad when the Romans invaded Jerusalem that there were certain mothers who even cannibalized their children because of the famine. I mean, think of that. Yeah, I know it's a horrible image, right? But it was a horrible time. And Jesus says it's going to get really, really bad. And along with that, as they destroy the city, which he says if he wouldn't have cut it short, there would have been no life left. And here's what happened. Over a million Jews were killed. So from a Jewish standpoint, that really was, in a very real sense, the end of their people. Or at least they would have thought it was the end of their people. I mean, huge. We're talking major destruction and he says along with that there is the abomination or the desecration of the temple now a little history to help you remember how significant the temple was to them goes back to king david this idea that we need to build a house for god somewhere here that represents god's presence with us and david says i have this palace and god should have a house And of course, he didn't actually build it. It ended up Solomon was the one who built the temple. And for the Jewish people, that was a very important symbol. Like, maybe this is a decent comparison, though it doesn't even grab all its significance, but to say the White House in America. This symbolic building means a lot to us. To them, I mean, there was no more important structure to them than the temple. It it, it had so much to do with God's presence with them, God's favor toward them as a people group. And historically, that temple had already endured atrocities and defilement. In fact, the guilty parties, which is ironic, that you see throughout the Old Testament, almost primarily you see the guilty party being the Israelites themselves who erected pagan idols in the temple. Part of their mixed worship. They, they, yeah, okay, they believed in Yahweh, their God, but they also had these images representing the other gods. They said, oh, we'll just take the best of both worlds here. They had a divided worship. And so within the temple itself, there was this defilement that took place. That was one way the temple was desecrated in those days. Another example, which was prophesied by Daniel, he mentions Daniel's prophecy in verse 15. Another example prophesied by Daniel was when a man by the name of, this is a tough name, but Antiochus Epiphanes who was the leader of Syria back in the 100s BC, he led an army into Jerusalem and ransacked the temple at that time. And when he invaded, he actually sacrificed a pig. And if you know Old Testament law, an unclean animal sacrificed a pig and sprinkled its blood all over the temple. And then erected an image of Zeus in the temple. Complete sacrilege. Abomination. And you, this is a little interesting 
historical note here. So the holiday Hanukkah. Around the time of Christmas, do you know the history of Hanukkah? Probably not. I mean, I didn't, as a kid, I remember having friends who celebrated Hanukkah who were Jewish and just being jealous because they got eight days of gifts. You remember feeling that way? So this is what Hanukkah actually goes back to, that historical event, because after Antiochus Epiphanes invaded the temple and desecrated the temple like that, a, a group of Jewish freedom fighters known as the Maccabees fought against the Syrians and eventually fought their way back into the temple and cleansed the temple. And as the story goes, after they cleansed the temple and removed all the pagan imagery, they lit the menorah. And supposedly, miraculously, they didn't have enough oil and yet the menorah remained lit for eight days. And that's why they have eight days of gifts. So that's just a little historical side note. But I'm sharing that with you to say this building has gone through a lot already. It's already experienced, in a sense, abomination and desolation. And for the Maccabees to go and take it back was a hope-filled sort of um, good, encouraging, uplifting reality for them in ways that it's hard to even estimate. And they wanted to believe that this building would remain and that this would continue to symbolize and represent their favor with God and their solidarity as a nation. And so for Jesus to say here, it's going to happen again, I mean, that would have rocked their worlds. It would have rocked their worlds. He doesn't say, fight, stand your ground, do whatever you can to not let this happen. He says it's going to happen. And when they start, when you see these signs, when you see the Romans coming, get out. Don't even stop to get your things. Just go. So here's the question again. Why? If we have a sovereign God who's in control of all things, to include the snow that is falling outside right now, why in the world wouldn't he stop this? Why would he let this happen to his house? It's a really important question. What if, even from the beginning, even from David's first idea regarding the temple, what if there's a sense in which we humans miss the point? What if, what if there's a sense in which we attribute more value to things here, especially things here that are sacred to us? What if we attribute to those things more value than they actually have? What if we are easily distracted by things here and we don't realize the true value is in the person of God in our relationship with him? What if that's the point? What if we need to be taught that God doesn't live in what we build for him as much as he lives in what he builds? Not so much in the physical sphere because he says everything here is eventually coming down, but more so in the spiritual sphere. And I'm telling you, the significance of that is hard to even comprehend. And not just the significance of that in terms of, wow, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting idea, that's an interesting thought. I can see how that's encouraging in terms of, okay, yeah, everything is going to get wrapped up on this planet, and so God has for us to live with him forever, and there's encouragement there. But, but right down to the details of my life and your life, listen to this. So you know elsewhere in the New Testament says we've all, we've got this body and, and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You've heard that. And can we all admit we've defiled this temple? Can, can we all admit that we've mixed worship in our hearts and minds and we've even done things with our physical bodies that we're ashamed of that we probably wouldn't want anyone in here knowing about? that left to ourselves would leave us isolated, leave us separated from our God? And what if we admit that all that bad stuff happened with this temple of my body because I'm not as in love with my creator as I ought to be?
And yet God allowed that to happen. He allowed that to play out in my life and your life. And he's graciously and mercifully working to show me that he's provided forgiveness. He's provided cleansing. He's provided, remember Jesus says, tear down this temple in three days I will raise it up. He's provided a temple, a place to dwell with him, namely in union with Christ, that through that relationship we know we are forever bound to God, bonded to God. Other New Testament imagery, married to God forever. And he says, I live in you, you live in me. And there's this New Testament teaching about the church, and it's, there's talk about a foundation, there's talk about a building. We like these stones that are built together, that God has built this dwelling where he lives with us, in us. And it's not tied to, listen, it's not tied to anything here in the physical realm, which is kind of mind-blowing, right? But it's not. So the things that we get so worked up about. I gave examples earlier. Someone coming in and defiling our household or, I don't know, smaller examples. Jack Funk, how much would you love to walk into my house with a Philadelphia Eagles jersey on? I know you'd love it, man. And it would drive me nuts. And we get preoccupied with, I just want to get Jack's attention. It seemed like he was drifting off back there. (laughs) And little things. I don't know, you're a no-shoe household and someone comes in your house with shoes on. (gasps) Little things that are so important to us because of what we worship. Because there's divided worship in our hearts and God says, hey, look, relax, it's all coming down. You worried about a little mud on your floors? I got news for you. It's going to get a whole lot worse. This whole place is getting burned up, so chill out a little bit. There, there, there are better things coming. Thank God, right? And when you hear the news and you hear about another school shooting and you're like, God, again? He says, look, that's the way it is down there. That's what it is because of fallen, broken hearts that worship everything there. And it's temporary, it's limited, it's fragile. It's coming down, but there's good news. There's a temple. We, we read about it in Revelation. I don't know if you caught it when I was reading earlier. The end of Revelation where he says, look, there, there's no more temple there's not even look at how look at what it says so he goes from this is fascinating he goes from what's going to happen there with the temple and he says there's false christ i've already talked about that in the previous message it's kind of a repeated idea but he says hey look people uh so i'll come back around to what i was just getting at but just track with me here he says hey there's false christ and they're gonna say hey come follow me and come follow me and if you do you'll be safe and you're gonna be tempted he says but don't don't listen to him because when jesus comes you'll know it's unmistakable that's why he says in verse 27 just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures would gather. And he's just saying, look, if you, if you see vultures circling overhead, you know there's a corpse down there. It's unmistakable. So also, it will be unmistakable when Christ comes. It's not just going to be some guy with some interesting points and gaining a following for himself out in the wilderness somewhere. It's going gonna, gonna to be unmistakable. You will know. So don't follow these liars, these deceivers, And he says, verse 29, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, look at this, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heaven will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. You see, he was saying it's all going to be wrapped up Sun darkened, moon doesn't give its light, stars fall from the sky. Now, I'm just going to let you in on a little insider information here. A little theological insider information. There's debate about this as to whether is this physical to where the, literally the sun and the moon go out and the stars fall from the sky, or is this symbolic? Is this just apocalyptic symbolism? Because you look in the Old Testament, there are places when God says of Egypt that the, the sun is darkened and the moon doesn't give its light and the stars fall from the sky. If you, look, if you want an example 
Look at Ezekiel 32 if you want to see that, where it's talking about these in symbolic terms. It didn't literally happen back then. He's just saying the nation is going to be destroyed. It's symbolic of the downfall of the nation. So there's debate about this, but everyone believes at some point the physical order is going to cease. So it's not even so much about trying to figure out every little detail of that as it is Jesus saying, look, this physical order is not a place worthy of your faith, trust, hope, security. It's not. That's the point. That is the unmistakable point. Like I've said before, hey, you can go all the different views of eschatology, end times, how we, and there's tons of different debate and it gets really confusing and detailed. But I mean, the point of it all, why wouldn't God just give us a divinely inspired chart? Boom, there it is. That's what's going to happen. Why did he leave it a little bit unclear like this so that it's always hindsight is twenty twenty, just like the first coming of Christ. We believe the second coming of Christ, it'll, things will, oh wow, now it makes perfect sense. But why does he leave it in this sort of foggy way for now so that we might not miss the root of this, the heart of this, which is to say, hey folks, you get really worked up about stuff here and it's all coming down that's the point I meet with people and counsel people related to family relational struggles and brokenness of all kinds and so much of it is people unloading and saying I, things just have i try i was building for god we went to the church we did this i tried to get my kids you know in awana and this and that and the other thing from the from their youngest years and trying to build this household and it's all falling apart What's the deal with that? I mean, I hear it all the time. Hey, I had these plans for ministry and then this happened. And it's all about what we, we thought we were building for God and now it's all coming down and I can't make sense of it. Why, why would that be? And the point of what Jesus is teaching here is look, Everything here is coming down. There's nothing worthy of your trust here. And that's why he goes on to say in in vivid ways, look what he says in verse 32 and following. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know the summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So we could sit here, we could debate, okay, which generation? He says, this generation, is it those? It seems like those people, because 70 AD, all that stuff happened. Maybe that other stuff was just symbolic. I mean, either way, it has a future fulfillment as well. It is still relevant for us. And the point for us is verse 35. Look at it again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He says that you can bank on You can trust my word. This world is fragile. Christ's word is not. Aren't you thankful? Priests can be killed. Land can be invaded. Buildings can be destroyed. Jesus and his kingdom cannot. You see, that's the point. What you're trying to build with your career may disappoint you. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe you'll fulfill all your hopes and dreams in your career, maybe. Or, or maybe you'll find yourself disappointed. Your family, you, you may be blessed and things have come together pretty well and you're enjoying the blessing of God in that sense. Or it may be that things are just not what you thought. They haven't played out the way you hoped they would. I mean, either way, everything eventually will be wrapped up down here. It will pass away. We will die. Whether Jesus comes back, which would be great, he comes back first and takes us, or we physically die. But this will come to an end, this order, this physical place. And the best thing God 
can do for us, he has done for us, as he's told us the truth. We know what we need to know. So that when we watch the news or we hear what's happening, we, we know what is coming, ultimately. And along with that, there, there is peace, there is invincible security. There is this understanding that at some point, like it says, several places in the New Testament, but I'm, I'm thinking of um, Colossians right now, where it says that God is, is summing up all things in Christ. Same thing in Ephesians. I mean, so that at the end of the day, so at the end of existence, in terms of our physical, limited, temporary existence, we see that Christ is all in all. That he is the point. Christ alone, forever. And when God recreates this earth, as we read in Revelation, the new heavens and new earth, and we live and we inhabit this new place There'll be no more traces of sin, curse, death. No more reminders in our physical bodies of those shameful things we've done. It's all gone. It's a new world, a physical world, in which everything points unmistakably to the greatness of God. A dwelling in which we are not any longer, and I can't wait for this, we are no longer struggling with mixed worship. With, well, this is, wow, I should have a preoccupation and all the frustration that goes along with that, the stuff we are preoccupied with here. No longer, just gone. And it says we will see Jesus and we will be fully captivated and liberated by seeing him. And everything in our physical existence at that point that will go on eternally will unmistakably point to his greatness. And we'll know it. And there'll be no more sin. And no more anger, Greg. And no more anxiety. Sorry, not that Greg's the only one that gets angry around here, but he was talking about Sunday school, so I thought I could. That's what awaits us, God has told us, everything we need to know. And I believe, I truly believe, after studying this and spending a lot of time digging through these details and trying to get a similar, you know, a, a clear picture of how, how things play out, and I think there's, a, there's an appropriate sense of that, doing that, but man, I became convinced, wow, this is the root. This is what preaches gospel encouragement to me right here, right now. And I hope it's been encouraging to you. Let's pray that God helps us to remember this, all right, this afternoon as we go into a new week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for the beautiful snow falling outside right now and the reminder that though our, our sins are like crimson or scarlet, red, that you have washed us whiter than snow. That the, the true king has come to set us free. And God, we, we admit to you that even as your children, there's often duplicity within us. There's mixed worship and we see the gospel and we see you as a good good father at times and other times we're captivated and enslaved to things in this world and we experience as a result of that such frustration and grief and fear and greed and so in this moment of clarity we are thankful and we praise you for your provision as we live in this world of Difficulty, famine, conflict, clashing kingdoms, disease, earthquakes, natural disasters of all kinds. We live in this world that is so clearly broken. Help us to remember your kingdom, the permanence of it, your invincible grip on us, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us and that is our dwelling and our peace. Help us to look forward to the day, God, when there is no sun, there is no moon, no need because you 
are our light. God, we love you and praise you for allowing us the privilege, the inexplicable, unspeakable privilege of, of belonging to you because of grace through Christ. So help us to remember and give thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.